happening today. Uh, but anyway, uh, happy days are done. Again, not just because of jobs. Uh, project part one is going to be formally sort of unveiled. Uh, I got uh, Sushavan, since you don't believe me when I say the project part one is ready, you know, I got Sushavan to say is indeed unveiled. Uh, so actually, I'm going to talk a little about the uh, uh, inverted indexing, which is the only other part that is needed for that project. And then I'll talk about that, and then we'll show you the project specification, saying right, this is where it is. You know, you still have to look at it anyway. I mean, it's a program. I mean, we cannot tell you um, how much more to do. Um, and then um, the other thing is that we also have enough topics now that I have. Good, I'm going to uh, send you a homework on uh, all the things that we have discussed till now. The, the one on matrices is sort of a refresher, you know. Um, but this other one would be actually about the things that we discussed. Uh, it would have uh, all the things we discussed in other, the vector space similarity, Jacquard similarity, all these things, plus uh, uh, some of the stuff we'll be discussing uh, today, inverted indices, indices and uh, also uh, tolerant dictionaries, which I hope to get to today. Okay, so that's what it's going to have. Um, I have, since I didn't send that, I mean, when I send the uh, homework out, uh, it again be up on the web page. And when I do that, I'll also put the, uh, put the uh, due date. Uh, for the project part one, um, which will be, uh, the due date will be September 27. Okay. And we already sort of gave it extra time, uh, but I really do want to make sure that you guys um, get the project part one going fine because part two depends on part one, part three depends on part two. And uh, and in general, part one is actually not all that hard. I mean, I'm sure Sushon will say that again. Um, but the bigger issue really is uh, you, you just really want to get used to the setup there, you know. But if you don't get used to it, then you can't do that other parts. So then you better start. Okay. Um, so that's regarding that. So as I said, I'm going to talk um, um, a little about uh, indexing and retrieval, and then uh, then uh, uh, basically now Sushovan will speak for a couple of minutes, uh, show the project to you guys, and then I'll continue with the rest of the class. Okay. Um, uh, any questions before I start? Yes. term has its own weight. Each term has a TF weight and an ITF weight. Okay, and um, so that t its TF weight, I mean its IDF weight is common across all the documents. It's a global property. Its TF weight is with respect to that document. And in trying to come up with the weight of that term for that document, you multiply its TF weight from that document times its IDF weight. From for the corpus, and that would be the weight. And then for the second one, it will be TF, you know, that word's TF times that word's idea. So the values on the, uh, 
gf distance and gf radius distance follow for sums of those? Yes, that, those are basically, no, those are the, so you then do the dot product on top of the, then you compute the vector similarity, which is dot product divided by the normalized uh, values. Okay, in fact, we'll be seeing that again today. Any other questions? Okay. Um, okay, since I showed this to you, remember don't read the slides. So by, you know, irrespective of whether you use TF-IDF or not, you know, it's like clearly if you're doing, you know, we're assuming that we're going to do vector similarity more or less, okay? Uh, the one thing that we know is that you essentially are stuck with this document term matrix, okay? Um, essentially each document um, is a vector in the space of terms and each of the terms have weights. And you know you can compute these weights any which way. I'm mean, hoping that you will compute them in the TF-IDF. That's what I'll assume here. Okay. Um, and then of course for each document, I also can store, for example, the one over document size. Right? Because there's no point in recomputing the document size every time. Okay. By the way, you know you can see also that. I don't necessarily, uh, so most of the time we would be computing cosine theta um, half metric for uh, the document vector and the query vector, okay? And so that would be basically the dot product of D times Q divided by uh, the, the magnitude of D and magnitude of Q, okay? now. You know, it's not surprising, you know, it depends on that. Now, today we'll talk a little bit of more of the efficiency, I mean, the, the, the programming parts, okay? It's not, there's no huge theory there, although there could be interesting theory in terms of distributed indexing, we won't get there today yet, okay? Um, so, it's just a question of, all you really want to do is rank documents in terms of reducing the vector similarity value. That's what you want to do, okay? So remember that one interesting thing is you don't need to actually compute Q because Q would be common for all the documents, right? All you really need is the D size to normalize. If, if you don't divide it by Q, then no, nobody has been divided by Q, so they will still have the same exact ordering. And so, you know, you just save yourself one division. That's about it, okay? Um, okay, so we will essentially be thinking that no, you could store it this way. So you have the document sizes, uh, you know, inverse of them so that you can do easy multiplication and you have the weights. Okay, now you are the weight of the term pj in document di. And uh, now the interesting thing to remember, the interesting thing to remember is these are huge vectors, but they are sparse vectors. Okay, in fact, we'll get into a, a different point. For now, you should just assume that I've already told you the space of terms in, in which the document is indexed. It turns out that after Susho one is done, I'll tell you that in traditional retrieval, we talked about this, that in traditional IR, people tend to assume only keyword indexing. That means not the entire document is indexed, only certain keywords are indexed. Those keywords are either humanly given, manually given, or we will talk about a couple of operations like a stop word elimination and stemming mostly for historical purposes because people will talk about it when you get out. Um, nobody uses them really, we'll also talk about that point. Uh, but um, by doing that, you can generate your own subset of the terms in the document that you are going to index the document with. Okay, I'm assuming here you decided which terms you're going to index the document in. So if I don't say anything, assume that you're actually indexing it in all terms. That every word that occurs in the document, you're using that as a separate dimension. So, you know, in general itself, keywords will be a large number of keywords for, you know, even in the library, there are a large number of keywords, okay, human limited keywords. And if you're allowing every word in the document to be, you know, if a document to be indexed under every word of the document, then you have even larger number of words. So the dimensionality of these documents is very large, right? Um, however, the good part is they're sparse. Most of those weights are going to be zero. Most of those weights are going to be zero, okay? So the question that you want to ask yourself is, how can I exploit the sparsity of the vector? 
Okay, and in fact, what we'll be seeing is the first idea, the dumb idea, uh, basically not dumb idea, it actually would have been a fine enough idea if it wasn't a sparse vector. But because the vectors are sparse, then inverted indexing becomes much more useful. Okay, uh, so anyway, so what's the simple idea? So you have this information, uh, one naive retrieval method, basically is you have a query Q1, which has uh, some number of words, now I'll also, you know, in this case, I'm also thinking that I've given, along with the query Q, I've given the one over the size of the query. But as I said, that's not actually needed to rank. Uh, and then we want to evaluate the similarity between this query and all the documents. Compute those numbers, and then sort them. That's all you need to do. Okay, so the method one is compare Q with every document directly, and if you actually have three documents and one query, this is what you would do. In, in the exam, so you will compute uh, Q times, uh, you know, uh, D divided by, uh, Q dot D divided by D and Q, okay, right, huh? and uh, so, uh, so, uh, that's what we'll do, so basically multiply, you know, Q times D by each of the documents, okay, now what's wrong with this? Yeah, there are so many documents anyway. So what? So the question is, are we doing useless work here? That's what you want to think about. If you want to improve, then you need to see what useless work am I doing. Notice that you would touch every document here. Right? If there are you know, 8 billion documents, you would multiply the query vector by each of the 8 billion vector documents. Right. Um, so the question, the question is, the question is, um, does it make sense? Because the query word I gave you, maybe I gave two words in the query, or maybe I gave you ten words. It's not clear that every document has all these words. When the documents don't have those words, there is no point in even touching them. Now you touch them here and say that it is zero. But you already wasted your time. It's not that the ranking is going to change. You see what I'm saying? It's not that the ranking is going to change. It's just that you had to actually visit the document, multiply, and realize that its weight is zero there. Zero times the queries, a query weight of that word, realize it is zero. So that's what you're doing, and because of which you'll wind up touching every document and just waste your time. Humongous amount. Okay, it may well be that the fraction of the documents that contain these words could be much, much smaller. In fact, you would hope that is the case. For most reasonable queries, the query words are probably present only in a small fraction of the document. If the words are present in every document, then presumably you're not giving an interesting enough query. You're probably giving a query like the, which is present everywhere. Right? So, because of that, Actually, we want to use an opposite way of doing this, where rather than uh, be document-centric, that means each document times query, you want to be completely query-centric. You're only considering the uh, terms of the query. And then somehow you want to have a data structure which says, if uh, this query has, let's say, you know, term T1 and T2, or you know, term Q1 and Q2, then when I have Q1, I want to know which are all the documents that have Q1 in them easily, and then only consider them. And then if I have Q2, then which are all the documents that have Q2 in them? And then only consider those. If you do it this way, then the billions of additional documents that have neither Q1 nor Q2 wouldn't be touched at all. Okay, of course you're paying a little price. You know, nothing comes free. The price you're paying is you're constructing this index up front. Constructing this index by saying, uh, for each word, since any word can be query word, so for each word, you need you know, some data structure showing this word occurs in all these documents. So that's called inverted index. So, and in fact, that's the only kind of indexes that you know of, really. You know, so if you see the end of the textbook, and you're looking for some word, and uh, basically one idea is to check each page to see if that word occurs in the page which would have made sense if in fact pages are non-sparse, that means all words occur on all pages. They don't. 
which is why we, we generated index. Why well, you wouldn't make sense because you think all you don't need to check. Yeah, that's true, but it's, so maybe you are looking at the context too. So the inverted index tells you which are the few pages in which this word is actually occurring. And so you just go look at them and see you know, whether or not um, you know, that's the page that you're looking for. OK? Right? Um, so uh, that's how we could do. That's inverted index. And you know, it's not surprising that it's a useful thing to do. So this is method for the naive retrieval. You know, it's in pseudo code form. Yes? Why do we call it inverted? Why not just index it there? <laughs> Um, um, CS is full of these kinds of terms. Okay, I mean, in the sense, uh, the term makes no sense. And the most recent word that I, most recent terminology I used, I just forgot. But I mean, you will see, for example, if you do search, uh, there is an idea called uniform cost search, and it actually is for search over graphs that have non-uniform costs. Why do you call them uniform costs? Why not? You know, so it's like, and I just forgot one more terminology like this. You know, the terminology is sort of a hangover. I mean, the, the only index is that, I mean, you could have forward <laughs> index saying for each document, what are the words that are present in the document? That's the forward index. But it's useless index, right? Because nobody goes to the document and say, uh, you know, I mean, if you go to the document, you know what words are present, or you don't know how to read. Okay, so the only useful index is the inverted index, but it's called inverted index. Um, so in fact, the other idea is also that the way you know the large scale inverted indexes are computed really is by first computing the forward index for each document. You consider the words that are present there, and then use all these occurrences of the words in the document, and then you invert them so that you would say term which are the documents it's present. Okay, so actually this word is slightly better than some of the other words like uniform. Uh, it's just that the only useful index really is the inverted index. So, uh, okay, so method one is not efficient. It needs to access most non-zero entries in the document term matrix. Okay, and so solution is inverted index and the data structure, which basically that allows you to just get to the documents that are relevant. Uh, not relevant in, in the other sense. I mean, it's relevant in the computational sense. You know, any document whose eventual similarity is going to be zero would not be touched by inverted index. Okay, um, so it's just an index in the back of the textbook. You know, keywords are page numbers, and so like for example, the word precision occurs in 40, 55, etc., 16, This is the way your you know, textbook index looks. This is the one you want to construct for your document corpus. Okay, uh, so each page is a document essentially. Think about it. Um, now the interesting question, of course, is uh, you need to have a place to, to store the index. You need to have one place where all the possible words are present, and for each word, there is a pointer saying here is the inverted index corresponding to that, that particular word. Okay? And the set of all words is basically the vocabulary of your documents. It's called lexical. Okay? And then each of these data structures essentially have the uh, occurrences of the words. Now that you agreed to construct the inverted index, you might actually use it for a little more than just remembering how many times the word is present. We'll see that in a minute. Okay. So you want to first the stages in using the inverted index is you first, you know, given the query words, you take the query word, first word, go into the lexicon to see, you know, you know, what is the pointer for its index. And then you go through the index uh, to see, get the number of occurrences of this. Of the word, and then you use the occurrences to compute your similar definition. Okay, uh, notice that for what we need, all we really need would be word one. Uh, basically, we, we, we just need something like it occurs in document D5 seven times, it occurs in documents D9 22 times, it occurs in documents D2005 three times. That's all I need. For computing our similar, our you know vector space similarity, we'll notice that in fact not only would I remember this, I'll also remember it occurs seven times in document five, and it occurs in the following positions: position five, position seven, position nine, position twelve. 
That information is not needed for you right now, but it turns out that if you have the positional information, it is useful in many other places. For example, if you want to do proximity queries, you not only want documents which have the keywords, but they should also be close to each other. Then the position information will happen. Okay? And also, when you're constructing the snippets uh, for the document, again, the position information could be useful. Okay, yes? If you have a static collection, you can also put that in the IDF, right? Yes, yeah, that we'll do that too, actually. We'll also keep the IDF. That's a very good point which is if the document collection is not changing, you can actually pre-compute the IDF value for each term and remember it. Right? That's the other thing. Uh, anyway, so here is an example. Okay, this is pretty much the one thing that you really need to understand, and then I'll say a few more things. But uh, So here is uh, you know, some, file, some document, and it has positions. Positions are just the word positions. Okay? Um, and so that's my file. And so here is my inverted file. You know, it says A occurs at positions 1, 4, 40, and entry occurs in positions 11, 20, 31, file occurs in positions 2 and 38 for this document. Okay, now I can merge the inverted indices from each of the documents and make a global inverted index. That's what I'll be doing. Right? It's not enough to just say, in this document, I need to first come to this document. Right? Um, so, so the overall thing looks like this. Okay? So you have a lexicon, which are the words, and uh, that you have, that you have, you know, index entries for, um, and then uh, this one basically gives the pointer to the inward index structure, um, and then these are essentially this is just telling you how many documents does Jezebel occur in, just so that you know how many documents will be here. Okay, that's all. Um, so in this case, uh, 20 documents have, uh, have the word Jezebel in them. And then these are the documents. The first document which has as well in them is uh, document number 34. It occurs uh, in position, uh, it occurs six times. It occurs in positions 118. Were you working with the libel there? What? Those are working on the libel. I don't know. I don't know that one. Okay. So, um, so uh, then uh, that's basically your. Uh, um, that, that data structure entries, right? Okay. Uh, this is your occurrence index afterwards, and the positional information will be helpful in using, you know, in computing the proximity. Okay. This is basically what inverted index is, and mostly what you want to do is use this inverted index to compute the similarity matrix, and it would just help you because all the zero entries won't even come up for consideration. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Uh, so this n docs is the number of document, uh, documents or the document number in which the word occurs? No, the number of documents because all, so in this particular case, document 34, 44, 56, and some other documents have this word. Okay. And in each of the documents, you know how many times the word occurs. Okay. So in some sense, actually, to compute the IDF, all you really need is this number, right? Because the corpus size is known, and corpus size divided by 20, log of that, that's your IDF values. And you can actually do that and keep it somewhere if you want. In fact, you could be as that, you know, you are saying, let's store the IDF. So you can store the IDF as one of the entries in the lexicon itself. Because IDF doesn't depend upon the document. Only DF does. Okay, so that's your uh, thing, right? Uh, and then using the inverted indices, you essentially, I mean, if you remember that you already have the information you need for computing the DF because you know the number of occurrences. Right? Uh, and so you can use that to compute your DF, and then you have the IDF value already, and then you have everything to compute the similarity metric between the document and the code. And this way of doing it essentially um, allows you to not touch any other documents that will eventually probably get a zero similarity to the case. Okay, one question that I'll ask right after association one is done is, yes, zero makes no sense, but does 0 0.0001 make sense? Well, maybe not, maybe yes. And so the question is, there is, you know, 
this inverted index idea does not change the eventual ranking in any which way. Because the only things that are not going to be touched are those that will have probably zero similarity. But if you want to improve further in beyond this, in terms of, of processing costs, then you want to use approximations. And we'll talk about a couple of approximations. Okay. In that case, then, the final ranking is slightly different from the, the ideal ranking. But if the ranking only changes, let's say, in terms of what happens after the top 3,000 pages, then you may not care. If I can get the right ranking in the top 10 pages, or top 100 pages, then if I'm missing you know, ranking in the top 3,000 pages, then I may not care. So that's something we'll do. OK, uh, so that's retrieval using inverted files. Um, so the only thing to remember in this case um, is that I'm, you know, my pseudocode now is going over terms. The loop is over terms in the query. But each term in the query, then I'll get the index entry for that term from my inverted index. And then it will tell me each of the documents there. For each of those documents, I sort of incrementally keep its current similarity to this query now that I've seen up to i word of the query. When I've gone through all the terms, then basically the accumulated similarities in these documents would be the final similarity to the query. Because the similarity is accumulated. You know, if you already have got, you get a little point for having <coughs> the term Q1 in you, and then you get a little more extra for having Q2, a little more extra for having Q2, and Q3, and so on. So when you add all of those, that's why this is basically being incrementally you know, extended. And then at the end, you just sort them in the descending order of similarities and show the results. OK? Um, so again, this is just saying the obvious that uh, if it doesn't contain any term of a given query Q, then D will not be involved in the evaluation of Q at all. And then only non-zero entries in the columns in the document term matrix corresponding to the query terms are used in evaluation of So the only those documents which have non-zero entries will be used. Um, and finally, this one is sort of computing all the document similarities are being kept, you know, and then you're computing its all the relevant document similarities with respect to type, you know, term one, then term two, and then term three, and then adding them up. At the end, you have all the document similarities at the same time. In the previous case, you will know first document similarity completely before you touch the second document, and then the third document. So there is this, you know, there is this notion of uh, any time behavior of an algorithm, which you typically don't think of. Uh, so if you stop the inverted index algorithm in the middle, you do not know any document's complete similarity to the query. But you know something about all those documents similarity to the query, but none of them for sure. If you stop the forward index, the original idea, the naive idea in the middle, you will know at least the similarity to some of the documents precisely, but the remaining ones may be better or worse. You have no clue. You know, so if I, for search engines, obviously, you do care about sorting over all the relevant documents, so this makes a lot more sense. OK? Um, OK, so this is actually an example. I don't necessarily want to go through this, but you should go through this to make sure that it's data structures, 310. You know, you should really have trouble with this. Um, but you know, if you, you know, here is an example of the query, some documents, and the inverted index corresponding to that query in the documents, and then uh, uh, here are steps after T1 is processed, all the similarities for the documents. After T3 is processed, all the similarities for the documents. After normalization, all the similarities. Right? So that, that way you can tell whether you know, it makes sense. Okay, that's basically what you want. And this, I believe, is what you need to do in project work. You know, you are, we are giving inverted index to you, believe it or not. The more interesting part of this is actually computing the inverted index efficiently. And we are making project one part one so simple that we will give you a already constructed in inverted index. You just need to use the API to get into the inverted index and get the occurrences and multiply them this way and add them and then sort them. That's all you have to do. Okay. And uh, but if you get on to the way, then the part two would basically allow you to do link analysis. And part three actually has. Uh, some additional freedom. You know, we have some pieces that we want you to do, and other pieces you can pick. What else?
know, what features you want to add to your search engine. Okay, that's some more interesting things to come up. Okay, so that's basically the inverted index part. Let me just say this and then we'll also come back. Um, the, as I said, basically the, what we did till now did not change the eventual ranking. But if you don't mind changing the eventual ranking, but want to make sure that the top 10, hopefully, or top 100 are not affected too much. That's the more interesting name of the game that, you know, if you have to play, if you have a large number of, um, you know, documents, and you have uh, very little time to rank them. One other thing I want to say is the most important, the most important temple real estate in search engines is Ben. Most important temporal real estate in search engines. I'm not comparing, combining with you. Temporal, what's the time that's the most critical time in search engines? <laughs> After the user hits enter, <laughs> you know, with their query, and before that page gets shown. That's the time that's the most important. You see what I'm saying? You could spend tons of time before queries come. Overnight, you can do all sorts of pre-processing. Nobody cares. Okay. Um, if you can amortize that by reducing, you know, shaving off even a few microseconds from the the hard part, which is after the query is presented and before you show the results. If that time is reduced, you are in good shape. In what index makes complete sense exactly because of that. Because you spend a lot of time constructing the index, but then that way it cuts down the query time processing. And you can do a little more. If you know, this one is saying that sometimes you might want to do even more than that. Even with inverted indexing, there will still be too many documents left. Especially because, as we'll see in a minute, um, if you if you actually index documents in terms of each of the words, then it's possible that some of the it's possible that basically suppose I have the query the White House. Now the will occur pretty much everywhere. Now if you do not remove the from indexing, then inverted index basically doesn't give you any advantage. Any advantage. The question that you want to ask yourself in the back of your head for the you know before I answer it in the next 10 minutes is do search engines remove any words from indexing or not? Traditional IR actually suggests that you remove some words from indexing. But do search engines remove some words from indexing? And if they do not, then inverted index is not as useful for them as I made it out to be. The advantage of inverted index is based on the fact that the words of the query typically fall in a very small fraction of the full set of data documents. If on the other hand, I'm allowing words that pretty much fall in most of the documents, then inverted index is no better than you know not using inverted index. So in that case, then I need to start shaving at the query time somehow, okay? And somehow basically reduce the number of uh, documents I process, number of documents I process, okay? Um, such that, uh, uh, such that I can still give you the top 100 answers close to their right rank. Okay, and um, so here are some ideas. So basically this is just saying that if you want to further reduce the documents, for which we compute the query distance. Inverted index already is you know, removing the documents which will have eventually zero similarity. But suppose I want to cut down further more, then I need to start cutting down documents whose eventual similarity is not zero, but maybe a little above zero. I mean, if you cut down documents whose eventual similarity is going to be 1.0, that helps you, because then you lost the top 100, or top one even. Okay, so you want to start cutting down things which are close to zero, but not quite zero. And that can actually save significantly, okay, uh, in terms of the amount of processing you do. Remember, again, you might think, you know, what's the big deal here? But the big deal is after the user hits enter and before you showed your rank results. If you take too much time and you say, give me a day, I'll get you really good results, you know, you would not have any customers, right? Okay, so uh, we are now willing to do this because most users want high precisions at low recalls, especially in search engines. 
It's also true sort of intention like IR, but even so true in uh, text images. In fact, how many of you have ever actually, if you think about it in the last one month, how often did you go to the second page of the results for any query? Right? And if you're not, then obviously nobody really knows what happens. In fact, it, it doesn't even matter if you have no clue what the ranking is after the top 10. The question really is, can you get top 10 close to top 10 without doing wasted time in sorting the rest of the rest of the rest of the Okay, so here are some ideas. The query-based ideas, some of the query-based ideas are, don't consider documents that have less than K of the query words. Just, I'm just throwing them out here. So, so previously, you are not considering documents which have uh, less than one of the words of the query. Right? Less than one of the words means it has zero words of the query. Those you are not considering. Now I will increase K to be a little higher. So don't consider any documents which have less than one of the, less than two of the words. This actually makes sense if you have a long query. It's not as great an idea if in fact you have only two words and you, you know, skip one of them. But actually for traditional IR, in fact, you do consider large queries, long queries, and so this is a not a bad idea. Can anybody think of a better version of this? Here Percentage. I'm saying if there are 20 words in the query, you know, maybe I would not consider any documents which have more than yes. yes. You could do it like percentile, like as long as it has 20% of the words that way you would. Yeah, but I mean that's fine. That's still basically this. The real question is who is the losers? Once, as I remember what I said, you know, if everybody in this room is going to be saved, then it doesn't matter who is important here. If only 10 of us are going to be saved, then it does matter who gets the tickets, right? So do we know, yes? Uh, maybe you can ignore the words that, uh, that have a really low idea of convention. Exactly. Instead of just assuming all words are created equal, which we don't believe anyway, you know, consider words which have low idea and remove them from consideration. It's a very reasonable thing to do. You understand what I'm saying? And that way, you suggest, so now, so the second idea is don't consider documents that don't have query words with idea of above a certain threshold. That's just, you know, long, long winded way of saying what you're saying. You know, put an idea of threshold and say words, you know, that are above that idea of value are the only ones that matter. If there are documents which don't have any of the high idea of words, then they're as good as not having any of the words. And they should be removed from consideration. And this would cut down the number of documents you have to eventually solve. Now notice that by doing this, I can construct examples where your sorting would be wrong compared to the ideal sorting. It may well be that something that should be in the 2000 14th position gets put in 2019th position. But do I care? You know, I'm only going to get that first 10 results. Okay? Yes? You consider idea of the dedicated query. What? If, you, if somebody's looking for the word with low idea, it's global. So how do you, how do you manage it then? So, the, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so the assumption is that if somebody is looking for the White House, this will allow me to ignore the before ignoring white and house. If somebody is asking for the word the, <laughs> then this will allow me to ignore that customer and make my money off of somebody else. <laughs> right? Right? But on the other hand, maybe those are the customers that are good. That means like they will click on every possible advertisement you show them because they really believe everything is just as useful as everything else. But you know, that's the reality. Okay? Um, so the idea two obviously generalizes idea one. Yes. So uh, it might be possible that uh, a word has a uh, lower idea, but it has a uh, high value of correlation. Something like uh, if high have, value of what? I mean, high value from the correlation. Correlation of what? Uh, say uh, we have a query computer science. Uh, computer has a low idea uh -huh. uh, in the document corpus. Yeah. So I understand. So you're saying computer science together really is a word. Yeah. We did not, I mean, that's, those are all huge problems. We will actually talk about correlation analysis right next class, okay? Right now we are assuming, so if you believe computer and science 
are together, then you should actually have a word called computer science. And you should docu index documents in terms of computer science. In fact, search engines nowadays index documents not only in terms of words, but also in terms of phrases. Okay, so you allow both a, an index entry for computer, another index entry for science, another index entry for computer science. And that would take care of your problem to some extent. Okay, but this is generally the same problem that we always have to deal with, which is we are assuming all words are independent. If the words are independent, they won't be correlated. Okay, this is all assuming that those assumptions hold. Okay, and then we'll spend the rest of our time in trying to see that they don't hold, and so we have to improve our technique. But then actually, just to put your you know, ideas, people don't really do all that much of a correlation analysis anyway. Okay, in the, in the search engines. It's the right thing to do, but people don't do the right things necessarily. Okay. Um, then the document purpose based ideas are the following. Split the documents into two different or uh, k different barrels at least of relative importance. The first, first documents are the most important. Second set of documents are the least second important. Third set of documents are third important. And then first find the matches from the first barrel. And then if users are still hanging around, find the matches from the second barrel. If they're still hanging around, find matches from the third barrel. Okay, so for example, if I might, for example, say that the barrels could be, if I am talking about books, you know, books which are published by some reputable uh, public, you know, publishing houses would be the first barrel. Those which are published by like Vanity Press, you just printed it yourself, would be in the second barrel. And then I'll give you an answer from the first barrel first, and then if you're still hanging around, then I'll give you an answer from the second barrel. Okay, that's another idea. Okay, um, now the question of course, if you get here, the question is how do you distinguish between document importance? I gave you one idea, you know, you may sometimes know in the domain, you might know that certain books are more important than others. If you think in terms of web, link analysis essentially does that for you. You know, we'll talk about it later, but the more trustworthy pages might be in the higher barrel and the less trustworthy pages in the lower barrel. So, you know, going ahead without, you know, I know that you know, heard of word page rank. So, for example, I can put uh, all the documents with page rank above five in one barrel, page rank below five in another barrel. And I'll give you answers from the page rank above five pages first. If there are not enough of those, or if you're still hanging around, I'll give you answers from the page rank below five. It's sort of like page rank above five basically means everybody is citing this page, sort of. Uh, and so maybe it's an Okay, and you can combine these. You can actually, within each barrel, you can do this, if you want. The whole reason I'm bringing this up is, zero is just one you know, point. You, know, you don't want to deal with documents which will, whose eventual similarity should be, will be zero. But neither do you really want to deal with documents whose eventual similarity will put them in the last but one place. Unless the person who asking the query really is interested in what is the least similar document to it who has similarity above zero, which is very unlikely. Okay, um, so this is what it's saying, how to split into barrels. Uh, you can do based on intrinsic measure of importance of the document. Uh, for example, uh, short barrel contains articles published in prestigious journals, long barrel contains, uh, that, that, that. You know, the short barrel is typically the top barrel. And so, and then the, and put out the rest of the junk in the second barrel. Okay, so you might put stuff First in the journal publication, then conferences, then technical reports, then web pages, for example. Or if you don't have that information for some domains, you don't have it, nothing is published. So then you can use some other way, for example, page rank and other things. But the point is, this is really, you're trying to reduce the time you spend ranking the documents. Okay? Um, as I said, I can come by and uh, I'm going to talk. Yeah, let me complete the indexing and then you take them. Anyway, you have to pass the question. So what is indexed? Uh, the, as I said, uh, you can traditional, you know, you can assume that everything is indexed. That means every word has a, an entry. It turns out that's actually what is happening right now. Okay, but since this is supposed to be about traditional IR also, first we talk about traditional IR and then we talk about how to extend it to web. Okay, although web is on our mind all the time. Um, so, the, in the traditional IR, you assume that the indexing is done in terms of the keywords. 
that are either manually specified or you compute yourself. If it's manually specified, your life is simple. Nothing changes. You just use those words. Not every term, only the keyword terms will have index entries. The lexicon is only made up of keywords. Okay? Um, in fact, notice that most indexing systems used to be keyword based. That is why you see this increasingly obtuse terminology for you guys, which is full text retriever systems. So if you go to some, some you know, place, say for example, NSF and look for awards, you're searching for awards, they'll say, you know, if you want full text retriever, why the heck would I want anything other than full text retrieval? Why? Because you could have been interested in just keyword based indexing, in which case they have a much faster interface and you know it just only looks at keywords and if you are not using a keyword, it just ignores your word. Full text retrieval assumes all words, you know, it has a separate index with all the words and it uses that. Okay? Um, so anyway, if you are constructing keywords yourself, if you're doing keyword indexing and you're constructing yourself. For historical reasons, you should know these two terms, stemming and stop word elimination, because traditional IR systems used to do it. Okay? Um, so what is the idea there? Uh, stop word elimination, you essentially want to eliminate words that are just way too common up front. And for each language, there are certain words that you would up front say to your system, these are too common. So for English, you would have probably eliminated all the articles, um, and because there are just too many of them. And we will eliminate things like in and was, etc. Okay? Um, and so that would be stop word elimination. The other thing is stemming, which is if you, a single word in English, stemming actually makes a lot of sense for certain languages, doesn't make sense for other languages. Okay, this part, these are text operations, they're called text operations, and they are language specific to some extent. Okay? Uh, stemming makes sense in English. Um, because we have the same word with different endings, right? Um, and so retail, retailing, retailed, retailer, okay? And so the question, of course, is I want to end, you know, sort of think of all, of, if I'm reducing the number of words in which I'm indexing my document, I may just want to use the word retail to index all the documents. Instead of retailing, retailer, retailed, etc. Now that means when I give retailer as the key, you know, query, I convert retailer to retail, and then go to the index. That's stemming. Okay. Now this is a big enough issue that not every kind of stemming makes sense. In English, actually, certain ways of stemming, you know, if I'm writing a program, which takes a word and removes, you know, and then basically stems it such that you get the root of the word. Not every simple rule. I mean. Not every idea would work. Okay, there are some reasonable, uh, there are some enough exceptions to most rules. So, but so somebody called, you know, somebody has to sit down and write these crazy rules for English that would stem the word correctly. And a guy called Porter did it once, so we don't have to do it, thankfully. And so we use something called Porter Stemmer. So Porter Stemmer basically tells you that if the word is of this form, you can always end ed. You can just remove ed. Okay, um, but sometimes if you know you have to remove ed, but you have to put the e back. So sometimes you can remove ed. Okay, but sometimes you only have to remove d, but leave the e back because otherwise it won't be a real word. This is just English. If you don't know English, you don't even need to know this part. Okay, but then <laughs> you don't know any of what I'm saying, right? And so it's just very language-specific thing, and you know that's what stammer does. What a stammer does. Okay. Uh, the other things like noun phrase detection, if you're again manually constructing, then somebody might tell you that this is a computer science document. So words like computer science, data structure, think of them as single words. Okay? And if I do that, then I will get a bunch of a subset of the original set of words from the document. I will only construct the index entries for those. That cuts down the amount of work I have. Okay? So as an example, if I have a text like this, the number of web pages on the World Wide Web was estimated to be over 800 million in 1999. Um, those look like good days. Uh, then uh, if I remove the stop words, again, stop word would be a list of words that somebody has given you. That would be the, of, on, the, was, to, be, over, in. They're all gone. 
Okay. Now, if I do stemming, then estimated will become. This is actually a case in point. Estimated. If you remove ed, it'll be estimate. That's not a word. For some of you, it's a word. You can actually, you know, you're like they probably don't know the spelling. But you know, it turns out estimate estimate is not a word. Estimate is a word. So then in that case, you remove ed and put an e back. Whereas if it was walked, you remove ed and you don't do anything. It will still be walked. Now this is not computer science. This is just English formology. And one guy has to do it. And Walter did it. For you. Okay. So Porter Stammer is available. You can download it and run it. You know, and then it will stem your language. Okay. And then it basically makes by doing this, you will have fewer pages that you are fewer index entries in the lexicon. Okay. And then if the word user were to ask very nuanced queries, you still convert them back into the stemmed versions and remove all the stop words and then do the processing. Okay, so the, the question then is uh, uh, why do you do stop word elimination and stemming? Because of two different reasons. One is it reduces the index size. The other is uh, that sort of it improves the answer relevance. So in the sense, in the traditional IR, if you don't actually separate the word weights, then giving the same weight to the and the weight to white and the weight to house would, this would be different. It is not as good as removing or you know, giving lower weight to the. Those are sort of two reasons. Okay? Of these two, in some sense, I've been talking about the reducing the index size issue. Now, coming to web search engines, do we care about reducing the index size issue? And a classic way of figuring out is give the query the and say, whether or not you get answers back. In fact, at one time, if you gave the query tap, 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 www to you know, Google, it will say, please, it's too common, too many entries. We won't give you the answers. OK, which is actually an interesting point with respect to the previous um, uh, thing in the sense that stop words depend upon how the language evolves. OK, now, if I were to ask tap, tap, tap now, you know, I have to ask that, but I did ask the query the just before coming to the class. That's the query the. And it gives me that there are 6 billion, 80 million results. Okay, I'm assuming that if there are more English documents than this, those must have been written by Indians because <laughs> Indians don't use articles. I don't use articles, we think it's useless. Um, so you would assume that pretty much every document has the word the. Right? If you wanted to get sort of a good estimate of how many documents Google has, this is the number of documents that they have in English. Right? More importantly, notice that it no longer is actually telling you, please don't ask queries like the, you're wasting our time. You know, it is actually computing. There is apparently an index entry for the. It's just six billion, six billion, uh, 80 million entries long. Do you see what I'm saying? I, mean, no. I was showing you the previous, the, the Jezebel, and it, had, it appears in three documents or 34 documents, and it was going through multiple rows. You clearly don't want to write it on paper, right? So, but the keeping huge indexes is not a problem these days. In fact, I mean, there is interesting science there, there is interesting computer science there, uh, which we'll talk about in, when we get to web search engines again and talk about distributing indexes over multiple um, servers. But you do that now. And I can't find a better way to make you realize this than running the query the. Right? OK? And then you, know, you have these many entries and that. And it actually ranks them, <laughs> supposedly. And if you believe that it ranks them by very quickly computing you know, the similarity metric, uh, you, know, you are not paying attention. It just assume that you know this guy must be a teacher trying to make a point in the class. Let's give him a couple of answers and he'll get out. And sure enough, I didn't see the second page. I didn't even see the first page actually. I just saw that number. That's all I get. Okay. Um, so this shows that reducing the index size is not important. But what about this? The second reason. How do I deal with the second reason? I, actually, sometimes. Uh, Uh, 
Again, as I'm saying, if you are thinking that the importance of the word depend upon, depends upon what comes after that, then you are thinking words are correlated. You have to get this into your head, okay? I mean, words are, we are assuming words are independent. If words are independent, then the cannot become important because of what else comes afterwards. Okay? Um, so, however, this problem, uh, for the, this problem about uh, relevance, it can still be handled. What idea do we have that makes it handled? IDF. We have IDF already. So in the White House, the will wind up having much lower weight in the document weight. So in some sense, you're getting the second aspect anyway through IDF. And the first aspect you don't care anymore because you don't mind handling huge, huge um, you know, indexes. And, yeah. And then you don't make phrases search. Yeah, but again, those are all extensions, you know, doing phrases and so on. Okay. Um, so modern search engines don't care about the size of the index, uh, and the relevance part is taken care of by IDF to certain extent. Okay. Um, I will get to tolerant dictionaries, but before I get there, I completed the indexing part. So Sushoman gets to stand up and say. The, 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 the project is developed. Right. Right. So in this project, basically, what you will do is you will create a search engine of your own. And what has been provided to you is essentially an inverted index, which you have just learned about. So uh, what I would like to tell you is that you will do two tasks mainly. Task one is pure TF without IDF. And task two is using both TF and IDF together. Right? Uh, I'll point out a few common mistakes that happen. Do not attempt to cache the inverted index on your own. So the inverted index has been provided to you from a library called Lucene library. Just use that, call those functions. Do not attempt to cache it in memory because you might run out of memory. Okay? The other common mistake is that not every word has been indexed by Lucene. So this stemming and stop words, Lucene actually does that. So if you try to search for a term like library, it's not in the index. So you'll get zero results back. Okay? The other problem is um, sometimes, like Google, if you search for some terms, it typically only gives you results that contain all the terms. But in this project, we expect you to Return even those documents which have only one term of the query terms. Okay, so don't disqualify documents that don't have all the terms in them. Right? And the other thing is that there are many assumptions that you will make while you run this, uh, you do this project. So your results may be different from each other, and your results may be different from my results. That's fine. That's okay. Just mention your. Just mention your assumptions in your submission, okay? And if you want